All right. Well, we're back. And we sort of very briefly covered the history of psychology. Um, and I wanted to talk about where psychology is today as far as different perspectives and things like that. Um, one of the things you have to keep in mind when you think about psychology today is that there are multiple factors that contribute to any behavior or mental process. There are the biological influences, sort of like Plato would say, or um, you know anybody who's emphasizing genes or hormones or neurotransmitters or any of those kinds of things. They're looking at the biological influences on behavior and mental processes. So we have a lot of people today who are very interested in that level of influence, like what, what role does biology play? in our um, behaviors and mental processes. Then there are the psychological influences. And this would be all the things sort of going on inside the person's mind or uh, brain as they're processing information, right? Um, so this has to do with learning. It has to do with you know, emotions, cognitions. All of those things would be the psychological influences. Uh, this is going to include some aspects of the environment, obviously, because where did you learn to fear something? Well, from having experience with something, probably. Um, so learning is always going to um, have a certain amount of, of environment included in it. But we like to think about the, the social cultural part of the environment being sort of separate from just sort of incidental day-to-day -day experiences that you might have. Um, social cultural are sort of the larger systemic factors that might contribute to your behavior and your mental processes. So, you know, whether you're alone or not, what culture you were raised within, um, you know, what kind of things your peers influence you to do or not to do, and you know, you're trying to fit in, and all that complexity that goes on along with that. Um, compelling models in the media, things that you um, watch on YouTube or, or TV or those sources. So all of these things. The thing that we have to remember is that while it's true that individual psychologists might have picked one of these three areas to really devote themselves, behavior and mental processes should be interpreted through all three of these, right? That, no behavior is probably solely due to biology. No behavior is probably solely due to psychological factors. No behavior is probably completely prescripted by the, the cultural, cultural or social setting. It's, you know, some kind of interaction among all three of those things. And that's the important thing to remember about behavior. It's never one thing. Um, so think about what causes depression, what causes intelligence. Um, you know, why do you like soccer or not? Those factors, you know, whether you develop an obsessive compulsive disorder, all of those things are an interaction of all three of these um, influences. So keep that in mind. It's always uh, difficult as we go on through class and we learn about different theories about different things. It seems like we're only explaining an, an effect through one lens. But the truth is everything is multifactorial. All right. So today, we have a little freedom in psychology. We don't have one big um, field like behaviorism telling all of us what we're supposed to do. We have lots of ways to describe phenomena. So some of these I, I talked about in my history of psychology, clinical, I'm sorry, cognitive is what I meant to say. We talked about psycho, I call it psychoanalytic when I referred to Freud, but another way to talk about him is psychodynamic. I talked about behaviorism in the history. I even talked about neuroscience a little bit when I talked about how we came out of physiology. So a lot of these I've kind of touched on a little bit. Um, but for the social, cultural, and the behavior genetics and the evolutionary, I wanted to give some examples. So you could ask different questions depending on what your perspective is. The cognitive perspective asks things about what's going on inside your head. So memory goes on inside your head. Um, thinking goes on inside your head. So cognitive perspective is going to be really interested in those mental processes. They are literally about processing information. The social cultural perspective is going to look at the impact of the context, the chronic context, not, like I said, not just your individual experiences that may or may not ever happen to anybody else, but instead those things that get just naturally passed down to people as a function of the culture in which they were raised. We were all raised within some kind of family culture. We were all raised within some sort of geographic culture within the larger culture that we are from. It's, it's multi-layered when we talk about culture. We're not just talking about American culture or you know, Chinese culture, or something like that. We're talking about the, the different degrees. So when you were a teenager, you probably had a peer culture, the people who you spent time with and who you valued, um, who you wanted to value you, that kind of thing. Um, those those settings 
inadvertently and without any, um, sometimes we don't even know what happened to us, convey messages to us about which behaviors are right or wrong or good or bad and things like that. Um, behavioral genetics. This field of study we'll talk about when we get to neuroscience and the biology chapter um, because it's kind of tricky. What we're looking at is the degree to which our genes may determine our behavior. There is no assumption that your, any of your behaviors are 100% genetic. But what we want to try and figure out in behavior genetics is how much of your behaviors and mental processes are due to um, you know, your genetic makeup, your hormonal factors, and what, how much of it is due to your experiences. So in this field, they're taking both of those things into account. So we'll be talking about um, heritability, how much of a particular behavior is attributable to genes and how much of it is attributable to experiences and other factors. Neuroscience, really trying to figure out the hardware that supports our behaviors and our mental processes. So where are memories stored in the brain, right? Are there certain structures that in our brain that when they fire, they cause us to think in a certain way, which is biasing, right? That causes us to favor certain kinds of information or ignore other kinds of information. Psychodynamic, this is um, that Freudian area. So we're going to be looking at unconscious conflicts as a possible explanation for our behaviors and mental processes. Behaviorism, how, how are our behaviors reinforced? Like where does that information come from? Um, do our decisions get impacted by associations that we've made in the past? Um, so behaviors have sort of, you know, they're really referring to what the environment directly does to us, those direct experiences do to us. And then finally, we have evolutionary psychology, which is really an interesting, it's kind of an expansion of fun functionalism, which I've mentioned before. You know, what is the function of our different skills? So, you know, is our memory really a reflection of natural selection? Um, you know, has uh, evolution sort of shaped certain behaviors in us so that the ones that have were displayed by our ancestors who were successful in getting their genes in the future, that is, they're our ancestors, did they pass along with us their predispositions to be behave in certain ways, right, or to think in certain ways? So um, evolutionary psychology is pretty limited in what it can study, but the things that it, it tries to explain are always going to rely on evolution. All right, so this is a fun little concept to look at. Now, you guys have probably heard the old fable about the six blind men and an elephant, but for those of you who haven't, the, the premise is that there's an elephant and six blind men are led up to him and they're told, you know, to touch the object in front of them and, and say what, they, what, what it is, you know, guess what it is. And the man who encounters the tusk says, oh, it's a sword or a spear. And the one who touches the ear says it's a fan. The one who touches the tail says it's a rope and so on. Um, because each only is describing exactly what they're touching, none of them come to the correct conclusion that it's an elephant. They all think it's different things. It's kind of the risk we're running in psychology, having so many different perspectives and so many researchers who really just want to focus on the perspective that they like or that they feel like is the best explanation. So I thought it would be fun to see what kinds of mistakes we make when we only explain things through a certain lens. So I've got a little game called The Seven Psychologists and the Client with Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. So Obsessive Compulsive Disorder is a problem in the orbital cortex. Hmm, who would say that based on the table that I just showed you a second ago? Well, that would be a neuroscientist who would say that, right? Because I'm just interested in the structures. The orbital cortex is the structure I, I'm invoking here, and I'm going to explain it being based on brain function. No, 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 it's a sign of unresolved childhood issues, maybe that have been placed into the person's unconscious. So we have these conflicts going on. And that'd be psychoanalytic or psychodynamic Freudian kind of explanation. No, it's an inherited condition. It comes down in your genes. That would be behavior genetics. How about compulsions start as habits? and they're rewarded by the anxiety relief that they bring. Well, who talks about rewards? 
behaviorists. OCD comes from our natural instinct to control our environment. Whenever you hear natural instinct, you should be thinking evolutionary. This has you know, been passed down to us from our ancestors. OCD thinking and behavior is a reaction to our fast-paced, out-of-control lifestyles. It's the culture, right? So the social culture and interpretation. No, OCD is a matter of mental habits and errors that can be corrected. Mental habits. Shortcuts in our thinking. Cognitive. Okay, now you may relate to one or more of these explanations and think maybe one of them sounds like the best explanation to you. That's how psychologists are. They say, well, it makes the most sense to me that it's probably biological or that it's probably cultural or, right? And, and they, that's the lens through which they explain things. We're going to be a much better science in the long run once we can integrate all these different explanations and come up with, you know, one coherent way to explain obsessive compulsive disorder or any behavior and mental process. But for right now, we kind of are seven psychologists and, you know, attempting to explain outcomes. So I'm always going to try and go back to that three way, you know, three different ways of approaching the, the solution, the behavioral, the psychological, and the social cultural. I'm going to try and remind you that there are no simple explanations. Now within psychology today, we have lots of different approaches that we can take, right? Different, um, you know, explanatory areas that we, we can rely on. Um, but you can really group all of those into um, one or, or the other of these subfields that I have here on the screen. The psychologists are, are either doing basic research or they're working in some kind of applied subfield. Basic researchers tend to try and answer questions that are um, based on a theory, right? They're trying to see whether the theory is correct or not. So if I'm the um, psychologist from the last slide who said that OCD is a function of, you know, misfiring in the orbital cortex. I might do basic research to find out whether I'm right. I don't know if that's the right word I should say. I'm not wrong. I think if I'm going to be the most scientific I can. So maybe I'm going to bring in a lot of people who have OCD and a lot of people who don't. And I put them through an MRI scanner to determine whether there are different shapes in their, you know, different different um, volumes in their orbital cortex and see if my hypothesis that their symptoms are due to this particular area of the brain might, might be supported by the structures. That's basic research. I've got a theory and I'm testing the theories. And so there's different subjects that you can study in it. Some of them you've seen already in my descriptions and some I added in. They're sort of um, blends of different areas. But so there's lots of different areas where we can just do basic research, testing hypotheses, and try to move the field forward that way. Then there are the applied fields. Uh, a lot of you who know anything about psychology probably are thinking about the applied fields first and foremost. I think most people who think of psychology think of clinical or counseling psychologists, um, people who actually work with individuals who are having difficulties or are trying to improve themselves in some way, things like that. Um, we get a lot of attention for our applied subfield that has to do with treatment. But there are other applied subfields also, by the way, um, people who work in the educational system like school psychologists, um, people who work in businesses, we call those industrial and organizational psychologists. Then there's the subset that do other things like sports psychology and other kinds of applied fields. The idea with the applied side is that we do our work with a purpose. Like we know why we're doing it. It's not just to test a, a hypothesis or a theory. It's literally to move something forward. Um, human, factor, human factor engineering is part of the um, other group on the applied side. They're really interested in how humans interact with the objects that we make for them, right? So human factors engineers look at computer keyboards and workstations and those kinds of things to make sure that things are designed correctly for human use. That's an applied field. I have a question that when it's answered will be directly applied to that field. I want to know whoever came up with the idea of switching the order of the control and the function key on my new computer because it is driving me crazy. But that was just my little sidebar. Um, <laughs> I think that was a bad idea. So let's put psychology into context with other helping professions. So let's have the big 
field of people who do psychotherapy, right? Like there's all the people in the world who do some kind of treatment of something psychological. It could be improving, right? It could just be trying to help a person be their best self. It could be somebody who has a disorder, but we're doing psychotherapy. In the whole realm of people who do psycho uh, psychotherapy, some of them are what we call psychologists. People who call themselves psychologists have PhDs in psychology. Um, so that's a small subset. It's not the whole field. So clearly other people can do psychotherapy, right? There are psychiatrists. This is what, what Freud is, right? He was an MD and he was interested in psychological disorders. So he was a psychiatrist. Um, so there's MDs, which are medical doctors. There are DOs, doctors of osteopathy which are doctors who are sort of generalized doctors. The key thing is they usually do a one-year rotation on psychological disorders. If you want to have a simple way of keeping straight the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist, psychiatrists can prescribe medication. That's the big, you know, like, takeaway. Psychologists can't. Unless they're working in the state of New Mexico, in which case they can because they have different law. But um, no other state allows psychologists to prescribe medication. And then finally, we have probably our biggest group of people who do psychotherapy are actually social workers, counselors, marriage and family therapists, um, people who have usually at least a master's degree, although I recently learned that you can actually work as a social worker um, doing some psychotherapy looking things with a, mas with a bachelor's degree. You're usually not on your own. You need supervision when you're trying to do psychotherapy with less than a master's degree because you need certification and licensing and all sorts of things in order to be able to do psychotherapy. Um, so psychologists are part of the group of people who do psychotherapy. All right, good time to take a break again. Let's come back in our next segment. We'll talk about why do we need to treat psychology as a science rather than a philosophy.